This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Welcome back. This is Aaron and Bruce Norris in studio with Steve Pontel and Gregory Bradbard of the National Corps and the Hope Through Housing Foundation. Let's talk about the services really fast. Does every property that you own have sort of a different bucket of services because of how you're approaching this and how the way things are financed? Yes, for a, for a number of reasons. I mean, so, I mean, one of the things I've found is not only is it for those reasons, I mean, related to financing and such, but also every community has a unique group of residents there. They have a unique set of needs. Um, there's also a unique set of resources in that community as well. So what I would say is if you look across our portfolio, the services that we provide on site um, and just so everyone knows, in each of our apartment communities is a community room. And that community room we really use as a community center. So it's not just for social parties, but we're really providing meaningful services. That might be um, preschool. It might be an after-school program. We have about, um, actually about 30 um, after-school programs that we run on-site. Um, we do our fan- financial literacy works there, shops there. Um, our health and wellness programming. Um, we'll bring in uh, Zumba instructors or yoga instructors, that kind of thing. Um, we teach cooking classes um, and then mental health um, work as well. All happens in those community centers. But I would call it a variation on a theme. So you see a lot of very similar type programming across uh, the portfolio, but it is unique property by property and really does depend on um, the set of residents there. So we have a team of services coordinators who are um, our staff people whose job is to really get to know the residents. And really their job is to identify what is it that each group needs and then to either provide those resources directly or we go out and build partnerships to bring those in. So that might be a bank who does um, a financial workshop. It might mm. be a hospital who brings in nurses to do um, health screenings. Um, it might be a university that brings in students um, to do some type of other educational work with us. Uh, seniors. Wow. I mean, is the funding for that kind of thing all by money you're raising through the foundation? Yeah. Like Steve described, you know, there's a base that comes through National Corps and comes through um, essentially through the rents, but it's minimal. That provides essentially the foundation. Um, the other half or so um, is all private raised. So that's from individuals, foundations, um, corporations, and those who, you know, see the benefit of this model. Um, and I, I can tell you, you know, spending 20 years in the nonprofit world, Hope Through Housing National Corps have an incredibly powerful model, the ability to reach residents where they live right on site. I mean, like we, we like to call it a place-based you know, strategy. Um, but really what it is is the residents are already there, and it's tough to get people to come get help down the street, even, it's to, even if it's to a local school or um, to you know, a community center. But we can literally deliver it on site, put a flyer in the door that says, hey, come out Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, and this is what's going to be happening. And by the way, there's also a staff person, actually multiple staff people there who have the relationship with them who can build it and go, hey, Aaron, come join us. I think you might enjoy this. It might be good for you. What's the expectations that they're mandated to attend your events if they live on the property? So it's completely voluntary. Really? Yeah, it's not mandated at all. You know, they're they're living there as individual residents. Everything we provide um, is voluntary, um, but I'll tell you, you know, they do participate. And like I said, that relationship piece is big. And it's not just on the Hope Through Housing side, but I'll say um, our property managers um, and National Corps are incredible. And they care about the residents. They care about the communities. Um, they really pour themselves into it, and it creates an atmosphere um, that I think encourages people to want to better themselves. Um, and, and just going back to, uh, you know, we were talking about kind of that old idea of the projects. You know, what you find in our properties is so incredibly different than that. Um, and in part, it is because of property management. And we take really seriously when there are problems, we move those problems off property. Mm. Um, a great example is we have a no smoking campaign um, across all of our properties. So um, there's no smoking allowed anywhere on our properties. Um, across the portfolio, which is pretty incredible. And that, um, you know, that sends a message um, and that's all kinds of smoking. <laughs> that saves a lot of money too. <laughs> so um, today it's not that much more meaningful. Well, and one of the things that I also want to mention is many of our properties have market rate units in them. So the 184 we're doing in San Bernardino, 36 of those will be market rate units without any subsidy. And one of the things that we never have any trouble is renting our market rate units. Even though it's 20% market and an 80, and 80% affordable, quote unquote, um, because of the quality of the units. But it just goes back to all the participation. All the residents are treated the same. Nobody would know who's who. And all the participation in programs is voluntary. And the entire population participates. What's the, is there like a, a two, one 
two bedroom, one bathroom. Is there a standard unit size that you guys typically use? No, we do in our senior properties, you'll tend to have mostly one bedroom units in our family properties. You go to three, sometimes four. Um, every once in a while, we have to do five if it's a replacement unit and there was an existing five bedroom you know, mm. unit there before. Um, but usually twos and threes and then seniors tend to be ones. You said replacement units. So you're also buying properties that are sold and you're just renovating as well? Yeah, we oh, renovate okay. as well as we'll tear down and build new. Got it. Interesting. Okay. Um, Co-living. Um, have you uh, looked at that model at all um, for seniors or especially with some of the stuff that you're doing? Are you familiar with that model? Like communal living? Where the, the like maybe a really great living space and you've got little mini rooms based off the side, but a way to sort of... No, we've talked about it and there's a variety of innovations that we're currently exploring. Um, but as of right now, no, the, the challenge we have is the funding tends to dictate pretty standardized responses. And so right now we're looking at two motels, for example, to acquire in Pasadena to turn them into uh, uh, transitional housing for chronically homeless. And the HUD standards require that every unit has its own kitchenette and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we'll tear down walls in order to build that standard unit. There would be other alternatives that could be better, but the regulations don't tend to allow that level of flexibility. Uh, but we're fighting for some of that. Interesting. Certainly one of the problems for California is just the, the beginning pieces of cost. So in Florida, we bought a building lot for $13,000. We had a permit cost twelve, so we were ready to build at twenty five grand. In Riverside, we bought a lot for eighty, which is a, actually a really great deal. Permit will be forty, and we basically completed the house for for what the cost of the permit and the lot was in California. So you know when you go to Texas and Florida, you have a a running start at a cost break, and their median income though, California is about sixty, Florida and Texas are somewhere around fifty. So the only ten grand difference, but the housing is at least one hundred percent more, if not. So I guess what I'm what I'm asking how. How do you concentrate on California when the opportunity would be so much easier to do it in Florida or Texas? Yeah, what, one of our mantras is, if not us, who? And so it kind of falls in the category the housing need in California is so great, and the obstacles and the challenges are huge. So we are doing and looking at projects in Texas and Florida, and but at the same time, you know, we're committed to our home state to figuring it out. And one of my arguments is if cities really want something to happen, they, they can make things happen. And so the great example is, you know, in San Bernardino, again, from the time we got site control on a parcel, a five acre parcel, till the time we had it completely entitled, including environmental review, 90 days. From the time we got site control till we had construction completed and occupied, 18 months. And so if a city wants to, they can make it happen. And it's not so much the cost of land because five acres in San Bernardino was $500,000. And so that was a reasonable price. And the permits were what they were. But the fact that we could do that in 18 months versus five years yeah. made it an incredibly beneficial project. And so if cities want to, they can make things happen. So who led that charge in San Bernardino? Fortunately, the staff at the city, because this was a bankrupt city with no staff, the staff was supportive. And so the planning director and the planning staff, you know, we, you know, we weren't trying to cut any corners. We gave them and, you know, love to tour anybody, you know, probably the best multifamily project in San Bernardino. So it wasn't like we were trying to, you know, do something that they wouldn't be proud of because we knew we had to make a statement and build something that when anybody walked on the property, they'd say, wow. And so their confidence in our ability to deliver gave them the confidence to make sure that everything was expedited along the way. But the city staff really made it happen. Is there anybody, any city in particular in California you've been really impressed with other than San Bernardino? Um, there, there are cities that want things to happen. Sometimes the processes and sometimes the fees become problematic. Inland cities tend to be more responsive than coastal cities. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with political pressure. So the political pressure 
you know, NIMBYs, et cetera, along the coast are very high. And it's not a political ideology. It's, you know, the way I characterize it, a selfishness ideology. It's like, I got mine. I want to protect mine. And there's always a fear about those people, other people, whatever the case is. You know, even if I talk about, look, you know, how do you feel about a community where your own children can never afford to live in the community they grew up in? or your grandchildren can't be anywhere near you. And unfortunately, most people are like, eh, well, that's their problem. And so we've had a societal breakdown of the feeling of responsibility of producing communities that are holistic, that can be affordable by everyone. You know, one of the things that I talk about is the last place I'd wanna be living during a disaster is in coastal California, because none of the first responders live there. So we have an earthquake, and there's a nurse or a fireman living in Temecula, and you're in Malibu. You think they're gonna leave their home in Temecula, drive to Malibu, and take care of you, good luck, you're on your own. And so if a community was smart, they'd be producing housing for the people that they need working in their community for the future of their community. Unfortunately, people don't think that way. That's the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> I think the median price in coastal cities just went down a little bit. Um, NIMBYism, how, how big is a problem is that for projects that you're working on? Huge. I was I was disappointed in that specific panel a year ago. Um, it, it was wide ranging. The county was there. We had different nonprofits. Somebody from Fannie Mae flew out who specialized in homelessness, and um, one of the panelists didn't specifically want to talk about a project. It was a, a veteran uh, project, a retirement community for veterans, and the community was the one that squashed it, not the city. And the county was really upset because they were ready to go, and it was the community who got behind, got the council member to squash it, and that's one place less for veterans to retire. Right, and and the challenge we have is that the forces of no are getting more sophisticated, more litigious. And you know, for $5,000, you can file a lawsuit about just about anything. And so, you know, it, it is becoming an increasing challenge to move projects forward there. You know, uh, one of our fellow affordable housing developers has an infill project in Redlands that got a, a sequel lawsuit on environmental issues for which there are no environmental issues. It's purely a, a harassment lawsuit. And so there are some issues that the state of California should deal with, which is the abuse of regulations. So you're you know, no longer using CEQA to defend the environment. You're using CEQA just to stop things that you don't want. And so those kinds of challenges we have, what we tend to find is the more time and energy you invest in building relationships in the neighborhood, then the more likely you're going to be able to get through the process. Mm. And we, we invest a ton of energy building those relationships, touring people through our properties, explaining what we're doing in order to make sure that you know we generally can move forward um, and bring the community along with us. Uh, but it's getting harder and harder. And, you know, if you're not sophisticated about it, odds are you're going to have opposition. And elected officials have a tough time standing up to that opposition. Right. They want to get elected the next round. And if there's a project they don't like, and there's a lot of really interesting things. You know, we had Damien O'Farrell on, I think, about a year ago, talking about the housing first. And it makes sense. How do you can how can you convince somebody who's homeless to start getting off of drugs when they don't know where they're going to sleep or where their next meal is going to come from? It's just hard to get them. So house them first then surround them with services. It's really interesting. I work I live part time in downtown Los Angeles, very part time. And it makes me laugh the amenities that they have compared to the ones that you have. <laughs> you know, they're bringing in food trucks and offering, you know, yoga or something. But I mean, what what percentage of the people that live on your on site are taking advantage of all these things that you have to offer? So I, I think that varies site by site. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, it'd be tough to put a percentage on it. Um, but if you take, uh, you know, a family property, if we look at what we're doing there, you know, if we have, uh, say, 100 families there, you know, probably regularly, um, you know, we probably have 20 to 40 percent who are taking advantage of those services um, on a regular basis. You know, the after school being a huge one um, yeah. where that's a place where those families rely on that every afternoon so that they can go off to work and not have to worry about where their kids are. And they have a safe, stable place um, for their kids. Um, so we have ongoing programs such as that. And then a lot of kind of the one-off, um, like I said, workshops and trainings and that kind of thing that we offer throughout the year. Um, it's really as they, you know, as they like to be part of it. And another big piece that we do is particularly on our senior properties um, is it is about social connectedness. If you do any reading on uh, battling dementia and isolation and depression, um, you know, a senior's age, it's important just to get them out and interacting with the um, with, with others. Um, and there's we have a lot of success there. I mean, the seniors love coming out, um, even if it's just playing 
playing bingo or it's having a meal together. Um, it's, it's meaningful for them. And what we find is those social activities is what allows us to build the connections so that when we're providing, say, a mental health workshop or something else, we can engage them in that way as well. The number of seniors is going to skyrocket next mm -hmm. 15, 20 years. Uh, most of the seniors that are in your projects, uh, either one of you, are they, would they be otherwise homeless? Have they sold a home and they've got lots of money and they want to, I mean, you know, what's the, what are the, I don't know, what's their bank look like as far as safety? If you didn't have this, they're, yeah, they're let, homeless. Let me share a perspective and then Steve can jump in. You know, most of the residents who I've interacted with and heard their stories, um, they're on a fixed income. They're living off of social security. Um, yeah. If they were low wage earners to begin with, their social security is it's, not right. Great. It's not a grand. Um, even living on our property with rent that's fixed and that's, you know, limited, um, they still struggle to meet their basic needs, which means we even still have to bring things such as food pantries on to help supplement right. um, their food cost. Um, so that that's a lot of them. Wish they had you know tons of other assets. They don't. Um, I think if they weren't with us, you know, they'd possibly be living with another family member if if they have a family. Member. Right. And many of them, you know, don't necessarily have you know someone that has a suitable place for them. So, yeah, our properties are all income restricted, mm -hmm. and that includes both your income and your balance sheet. And so all that's monitored before somebody moves into our properties. And so the, uh, you know, the number of seniors on fixed income is just going through the roof, and the shelter alternatives for them is getting tougher and tougher, especially, once again, as our social fabric is breaking down, and fewer and fewer families are taking care of their own parents and you know, grandparents, which is another conversation in and of itself. Uh, one of the, uh, if somebody, though, and we have you know one of those kind of fun stories. So one of our seniors in one of our Fontana properties won the lottery. I think it was thirty-five million or a bunch. fifty million, something like that. And <laughs> and he liked living on the property, so he didn't want to move out. You know, after he won, the only thing he said he wanted was a faster wheelchair. <laughs> he has, which since, he does have now. Which he does way. have. <laughs> you know, <It's> awesome. <laughs> he has since moved out and et cetera. And he has been very generous in making contributions back for his fellow seniors, et cetera. But he didn't have to move. And so he could have stayed there if he had wanted to. So once you're in, you're in. We don't kick you out if you've qualified and then something happens. Okay. What um, is migration out of California? Is it a big problem for people that have no choices here left? They just, and especially maybe the younger, like you're talking about the kids, if the kids can't ever own here, so you do have the separation of the family, that could cause seniors to migrate. They just migrate back to their kids or their grandkids in another state. Do you see that as a problem? Well, you know, I, I think if you're thinking about the future of California, it's something we should be very conscious of especially to the extent it begins to affect the brain drain. And so the inland region, just as an example, 70% of the college kids that graduate from this region leave the region. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing a good job retaining our best and our brightest within this region, per se. California as a whole is still pretty much holding on. But there's a key indicator to look at, which they call the U-Haul index. And so, you know, the whole issue of take, you know, renting a U-Haul to go from San Francisco to uh, Reno you know, Kasha, 2000 bucks from Reno to San Francisco, 200 bucks because people are leaving in droves. And so long term, best interests of California would be to have population growth and retaining our best and our brightest and having shelter housing choices for every life stage. You know, college students, college graduates, singles, married children, empty nesters, retirees, et cetera. And there's just big holes in that spectrum throughout the state of California that would give people a reason to leave. Mm, maybe get in the dating services. I don't know. <laughs> I do want to cover quickly. Um, do you accept donations sort of on the plan giving front? Do you ever get approached with wealthy families who have got extra properties? And is, is your organization set up to receive those? We absolutely would be open to those conversations. I don't know that we have received a lot of donated property in the past. Land? Um, definitely. Yeah, we, have, we have from some banks and for others during the REO period of time. So okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely um, uh, bequests and trust that kind of thing. Um, land, I think, you know, we would be open to that, but definitely have to look at that on a case-by-case basis in terms of making sure that it's a piece of land that would make sense for us. Yeah, I don't get to talk to a lot of nonprofits that <laughs> they're like, land? No. <laughs> they're like, it could no make way, sense, Jose. though. I mean, we've taken some pretty, uh, uh, you know, some pieces of land that, that don't look very um, appealing and turn them into something pretty uh no, uh, pretty beautiful. So. You've got the, the relationships with the city, so if you know if you can meet with the city before you take it on and know it doesn't have an environmental problem and that the donor can take the write-off or do something creative with charitable remainder yeah. trusts, you just never know. But Absolutely. I just always like to bring it up just to make sure I cover our basis. Yeah, well, on unfortunately, the, we, we have a pretty incredible team that could help assess yeah. a piece of property pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. We would welcome any donation of anything okay. at any time. <laughs> okay, that's fair <laughs> we'll enough. We'll figure it out. Uh, I guess one of the final questions, um, I was interested this sh- in the last year, maybe it was 2017, when the accessory dwelling unit legislation came out, and it was interesting that the they put a caveat on it. If the cities didn't get it approved in 60 days, it was approved. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it looks like they're putting some timetables, knowing that the cities are sitting on stuff and NIMBYism is causing a problem. Uh, do you see that continuing to happen and that maybe the state is forcing the issue because cities are not keeping up? Yeah, the the best way to look at that is the various buy right initiatives that have been proposed by both the governor and the legislature, essentially saying that once you've gone through all the normal process, you have an approval, you're done, and you now have a right to build, as opposed to go through the whole process and then have somebody come along, sue, and then you have to go start it all over again. And so at all ends of the spectrum, whether it's accessory dwelling units, single family, multifamily, if cities don't enable things to happen, there's a higher and higher likelihood the state will continue to intervene because the crisis is so great. So my recommendation to cities is do the job that needs to be done. Make things happen. This is for your own population, the children that grow up in your community, and it's the smart economic development thing to do is have an adequate housing for the people that live and work in your community and figure it out. And so unfortunately, the days of true community builders and community boosters, now we tend to have people that have a very narrow special interest. And so it's harder and harder to have a community as a system conversation and understanding the critical role that housing plays. All right, man, we're out of time. And I definitely want to leave uh, some time. How can people find your work and where should they be headed? Absolutely. They can visit us at um, hopethroughhousing.org or hthf.org or nationalcore.org. And you can find on both those websites, both what we're doing on the service side and people want to donate and support, um, as well as um, our entire portfolio to see where all of our properties are, if there are people out there needing help uh, from housing. Any opportunities for volunteering if CPAs are listening or anything like that? Absolutely. Yeah. And they can contact me again, find that on the website and find my contact information, Greg Bradbart, and we'd be glad to hear from them. We'll also profile both of you guys and and we'll link make sure to link both of the websites and social media and whatnot so thank you so much for more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the norris group check out the norris group.com for information on passive investing with trust deeds visit tngtrustdeeds.com